Um, good evening. Uh, this is the monthly meeting of the Tucson Amateur Astronomy Association, and we're so glad to have people here in person and people on YouTube and people on Zoom. And um, so uh, we should have a great evening um, today. I wanted to mention to people who are in the room, I wanted to remind you that please no talking at all during the meeting because unfortunately our Zoom does pick that up and it interferes. Um, so we ask that you don't do that. Um, we will tonight with our guest speaker, we're going to hold most of the questions until the end of his presentation, and, and then he will spend some time talking with you about that. And I'm Mae Smith. I'm Tucson Amateur Astronomy Association president, and we have several people helping us tonight. Bob Rose is operating our camera, and Terry Lappin is on YouTube, and then we have Jim, Jim Knoll, who's helping us. Who is helping in front and and is also going to help with our Zoom people? Um, so I wanted to uh, kind of start today with just mentioning a couple of things about our speaker. But as some of you know, we don't usually give a long introduction um, with our speakers. Most of our speakers, it really would take a while to go over their qualifications and their expertise with you. But we also send this out in writing. And so um, if you are not um, a member of our club and you're looking for that, you can always go to our website and information about our speaker will be on our website at tucsonastronomy.org. Uh, tonight, we have with us a very special person. We have Michael Backich, and some of you know that Michael for a long time was with Astronomy Magazine. And one of the things that he's done, he's written 14 books on astronomy. And he also wrote a special one, or was special tonight for our presentation, is the Atlas of Solar Eclipses from 2020 to 2045. So, Michael, I, I have not seen this book before, and I'm going to go out and, and purchase that because that is such an impressive title. And I can't imagine having information about all of those eclipses in one place. So I'm, I'm just delighted um, to have that opportunity to look at that. So, um, Michael, if you're ready with your presentation, we will start. And I'm going to stand here a minute and make sure your microphone works. Thank you, May. Can everybody hear me? Oh, we're all good. Okay. So I need to start the PowerPoint, correct? Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much for having me in person. I don't know how many Zoom talks I've done. I'm so tired of talking to myself and not getting any feedback. Um, this is going to be way, way better. So tonight, we're going to talk about the annular eclipse that's going to happen October 14th, 2023. Oh, wait. I have to open with either a poem or a story or humor. Let's go with humor. Uh, solar eclipse. Okay. What did the sun bring to the party? A light snack. Oh, really? Apparently, they cannot hear me. Very good. Huh. 
I probably don't have to repeat that, right? <laughs> you know, I was thinking by that reaction, hmm, maybe Zoom isn't so bad after all. <laughs> okay, so this event happens in 134 days. Not a long time, but plenty of time for us to get ready for it. Okay, so it's 134 days from today. I know everybody in this room knows what a solar eclipse is, but we've got visitors online who may not. And so a solar eclipse is an exact lineup of the sun, the moon, and earth in that order. The moon is in the center. Okay, so if the moon is in the center, it's a solar eclipse. If Earth is in the center, it's a lunar eclipse. There are three types of solar eclipses. The one at the bottom, we're not going to worry about. Partial eclipse is, eh, it's, it's okay, you know, I mean, but nobody travels halfway around the world to see a partial eclipse. They do for total eclipses and annular eclipses. So the top uh, drawing shows a total eclipse, and the middle one shows an annular eclipse. Okay, what actually makes an annular eclipse? Well, the first thing we have to realize is that nothing out there moves in circles. A couple thousand years ago, our ancestors thought everything moved in what they called perfect circles, because the heavens were perfect. And so the moon went around Earth in perfect circle. The sun went around Earth, because Earth was the center of the universe and it didn't move, in a perfect circle, and so on. Well, skip ahead a millennium and a half or so, and a German astronomer named Johannes Kepler is trying to figure out why his calculations don't match what Mars is actually doing in the sky, okay? And he's, I mean, he's checked his math a dozen times, and it's fine. Finally, he hits on the idea that he's going to take this circle and stretch it a little bit and turn it into what astronomers call an ellipse. And one of Kepler's main laws is that planets, and pretty much everything else, move in elliptical orbits around the sun. Well, if it's an elliptical orbit, sometimes the planet Earth is closer to the sun, sometimes it's farther away. Same with the moon and Earth. So, first thing we realize is that the Earth sun distance can vary by about 3%. Doesn't sound like a lot, but it's almost 3 million miles. Okay, we are closest to the sun around January 4th and farthest away around the 4th of July. The moon has an even greater variance. Its distance can vary from us by about 12%. Okay, so sometimes the moon is very close, and you get what the media likes to call the super moon, which, you know, nobody can really tell the difference between one new moon this month and another uh, full moon that month and another full moon, you know, a month later. But I don't mind it because it's kind of, you know, it's kind of PR for amateur astronomy. So if it gets anybody out to look even at the moon, I'm okay with it. Okay, let's combine these two. So the moon can appear anywhere from 7% smaller than the sun, uh, larger than the sun, to about 10% smaller. Okay, if it's the same size or larger, you get a total eclipse. If it's smaller than the sun, though, you have a ring of not just sunlight, but the sun's disk around the moon, and you get an annular eclipse. Now, the Latin word for ring is annulus. That's where that word comes from. So it's an annular eclipse. It's what's happening on October 14th. Okay? Two numbers, really three, about this eclipse. The first one is its magnitude. The magnitude is 0.952. That means that the diameter of the moon is 95.2% that of the sun. Okay, so it's smaller than the sun, annular eclipse. If the magnitude were one or greater, it would be a total eclipse. 
but the magnitude doesn't tell you exactly how much of the sun's disk the moon will cover. So that is called the obscuration, how much is obscured by the moon, and it's about 91%. Okay, so this eclipse, October 14th, about 91% of the sun will be covered by the moon. And then the maximum amount of annularity, and what I mean by that is the maximum amount of time that the disk of the moon is inside the disk of the sun will be about 5 minutes, 17 seconds. Here's a nice animation that um, Michael Zeiler, my co-author, and Fred Espinak did, and it shows the uh, path of the eclipse and the moon's, uh, what, what's called the anteumbra, because it's an annular eclipse, moving across the United States and going through Texas now. And then it moves into the Gulf of Mexico, where we suddenly lose interest in it, okay? Because we're concerned about it in the United States, and uh, that's its path. Let's take a uh, little bit closer look at the path. And you've got uh, some interesting places that it crosses. Uh, Crater Lake, it's the October 14th, um, if you could be sure that there wouldn't already be six feet of snow at Crater Lake, it would be a gorgeous place to observe the annular eclipse. Um, the Four Corners region, it passes right over that. So if you want to be at Four Corners and see the annular eclipse, um, Roswell, anybody you know going to Roswell? <laughs> because he wants to watch the eclipse with E.T., so uh, <laughs> this is a little closer look. Let's take an even closer look. So the um, path of the eclipse starts, cursor, there it is, starts here in Oregon, and pretty good slice of Oregon, then a little bit of California, and a very tiny bit of Idaho before it moves into Nevada. And northern Nevada doesn't have a whole lot of people, but it's still going to move through there. And then continues into uh, Utah. And then down here are the, uh, is the Four Corners region. It continues toward the uh, southeast. And it has a wonderful diagonal. Oops, go back. Wonderful diagonal path through New Mexico. Ah, very good. Uh, before it hits Texas, and then a big swath through Texas. Now, because I've done a lot of these talks before, you're probably thinking, okay, Michael, where are you going to be? So I'll show you. My co-author, Michael Zeiler, lives in Santa Fe, okay, in the path. And Holly and I were visiting a couple times ago, and we were chatting, and Michael said, I have an idea why don't you observe the eclipse from our jacuzzi? Okay, we'll just sit. I thought, oh, I'm totally in, okay? But the more we talked about it, the more we thought, okay, but we have an opportunity here, and, and both of us have seen a number of annular eclipses. We have an opportunity here to do something we've never done before. So we're not going to be in Michael's jacuzzi, at least not during the eclipse, we're going to be here where the arrow is. And that is the location of uh, the ski resort where Michael is a member. He's got permission for us to set up in the parking lot. So this is the northern edge of the path. Why in the world would you want to set up in the northern edge? You'd never do this for a total eclipse. You want to be in the center where the maximum amount of totality is. But for an annular eclipse, and we've seen annular eclipses before, what we're looking for is an extended run of what are called Bailey's beads, okay? Bailey's beads are formed just before and just after totality during a total eclipse and along the edge of the moon during an annular eclipse. So what happens is, that as the edge of the moon approaches the edge of the sun, almost all, all you have is a very, very tiny crescent. And the only thing that's blocked out are these darker areas, and that's because the moon's edge isn't flat. It's 
it's got mountains on it. So the mountains block out the sun. However, the valleys between the mountains let sunlight through, let these beads of sunlight. Um, this was first described by an English astronomer named Francis Bailey back in the 1830s, so it's named for him. And I love this next little movie. This shows Bailey's beads during the 2017 total solar eclipse. So this runs for about 12 seconds. Imagine somewhere between a minute and a minute and a half of Bailey's beads. That's what we're going to get as we're at the uh, northern edge of the path. I mean, the southern edge would be the same way. So Bailey's beads, we're going we're gonna to do this for this eclipse. And again, I wouldn't do it for a total eclipse, but for this one, you bet. Will we see the eclipse? <laughs> well, I can't tell you that right now. This is not a weather map. This is a climate map. Okay. The difference is that climate is what meteorologists think will happen based on what's happened in previous years on specific dates. Weather is what really happens. Okay. Climate, you can predict climate years, decades in advance. Weather, you can predict about 72 hours in advance. In fact, I have a good friend uh, who uh, is the chief meteorologist for a TV station in Kansas City. And I've heard him talk, and he says, uh, the only reason I give a seven-day forecast is because the other guys give seven-day forecasts. <laughs> and I mean, you know, so weather is good about three days ahead, okay? And so one of my biggest tips, if you're going to travel to see this eclipse, stay mobile, okay? Stay mobile. I pulled some slides that show the weather, these are actual satellite weather shots of uh, this date, October 14th, in previous years. Uh, didn't I just say New Mexico was the best spot? <laughs> I mean, we, uh, okay, well, not in 2008, that's for sure. I mean, Oregon was pretty clear, uh, Nevada and Utah clear, but boy, New Mexico and Texas totally socked in. You wouldn't have seen anything. Skip ahead a few years to 2012, and just about the whole path is clear. Skip ahead again. Now, pretty much only New Mexico has a chance to see the eclipse in 2016. And then in 2017, again, pretty much the whole path is cleared. This is what we're hoping for in 134 days. But I can't tell you the best meteorologists can't tell you what the weather will be in a specific spot on that day. Just have to, we'll just have to see. <clears throat> okay, a few numbers about this eclipse. 6.6 6 million people already live in the path. So um, weather permitting, all they have to do is step out into their yard on eclipse day, look up and boom, eclipse. Okay, 6.6 6 million people. Here's where they live, okay? Nobody in Idaho. <laughs> it's a very tiny little tip of Idaho. Not many in that northern part of California. Uh, New Mexico has the big number, mainly because of uh, Albuquerque. And Texas has the very big number, mainly because of San Antonio. So here's where the people are. And then the drive times to the path, Tucson to Albuquerque, which is right on the center line, be a great place to go if you're not looking to get a room. <laughs> because it's the same time as their famous balloon fest. And so, you know, uh, didn't, you told me that you checked into uh, an RV spot. It was like 400 bucks. There's, oh, I mean, come on, people. But, you know, uh, so the drive to Albuquerque from here is about six, six and a half hours. It'll take Holly and I another hour to get to uh, Santa Fe, but we'll be there several days ahead. And finally, every spot in the continental U.S. will have a partial eclipse. The tip of Maine will have a 10% partial eclipse. Hmm, what about the old Pueblo? Good old Tucson. 
Well, Tucson will get a partial eclipse and it will be, you would think substantial, 78% partial eclipse. And you're thinking, wow, okay, well, you know, that's not too bad. Let me uh, disabuse you of that notion. Okay, it's a partial eclipse. It's basically nothing. In fact, 78% partial eclipse. Now, you and I will know that an eclipse is going on. So we'll probably be able to pick up that it might be a little bit dimmer than a, a normal sunny day in Tucson. But for most people here, if they don't know, they're not even going to notice that a partial eclipse is going on. Why is that? It's because that a 78% partial eclipse, full moon is what, tomorrow night? Tomorrow night, right? Yeah, okay. So full moon's tomorrow night. Go outside tomorrow night, look around. Pretty easy to get around. Full moon reflects a lot of sunlight onto Earth and fairly easy to get around during a night of full moon. A 78% partial eclipse, 78% of the sun covered is 220 thousand times brighter than the full moon. That's how bright it is. Okay, so yeah, it's a partial eclipse. It's a near miss. Don't even bother. Get out of town. Go to see this event. Okay, <clears throat> what are we looking for here during this event? Well, the first thing I want to say is the important safety warning. This is an annular eclipse. The sun is never completely covered by the moon, okay? So you need to protect your eyes throughout the entire eclipse. You need to wear what are called eclipse glasses. You can look at the sun anytime through them, but you need to wear eclipse glasses, and you need to have uh, approved solar filters on if you're using binoculars or a telescope at all times, okay, at all times. So the uh, the picture to the right show, <clears throat> excuse me, shows eclipse glasses. They're made of cardboard. They have either aluminized mylar or a black polymer that only lets uh, one two hundred thousandth of the sun's light through. And so they're very safe to look at uh, the sun with. So those are eclipse glasses. In the top picture, Holly's using a number 14 welder's glass. Okay. Um, only number 14 is dark enough for the sun. Now, if you want to use a welder's glass, go to a welder's supply and order it now because it's really dark and most places do not stock it. Okay, so you can buy it. And again, it's about three or four bucks for that size welder's glass. I, I'm kind of preferential to a welder's glass because I've been using that very welder's glass since my very first total solar eclipse in 1970. Okay, I have been using that glass. And then the picture to the lower left shows Holly observing the sun through one of our telescopes, three inch telescope. Notice that there's a filter on the front end of the telescope. This is really important. All filters go on the front end of your optics, the front end of your eyes, the front end of your binoculars, the front end of your telescope. And in addition, you can see the little finder scope is capped on both ends. There's no chance that anybody's going to look through the finder scope and lose vision in an eye, okay? So what you don't want is you don't want to erect a sign like this after the eclipse, especially like this, okay? <laughs> no, no, safety first, okay? First thing I look for during any eclipse is what's called first contact. It's the beginning of the eclipse. Now, I have friends that just, you know, say, Michael, come on. I mean, look at this. I mean, no big deal, right? Well, it is a big deal. And you know why? Because it says you're in the right spot. The eclipse is stopped. We're here. It's actually happening. So first contact has always been very meaningful to me. And uh, so somebody there, if you're with me, it'll be me screaming out first contact and everybody goes, okay, big deal. <laughs> Another thing that you can look at as the eclipse progresses, if there's a tree or trees near your site, you can look for pinhole suns. 
okay? Because the spaces between the leaves in the tree act like pinhole cameras, and they project these crescent suns, either on a building in this case, or on the ground. Now, we are going to be in the southwest, so you may not be at a spot where there's going to be a tree. So bring your own pinhole projector. Bring a colander, and you can see this effect. And Holly and I have even, you know, poked uh, holes in uh, cards that, you know, kind of spell out the date of the eclipse, and you see crescent suns, and it's kind of fun. Um, long ago, I had a friend that said, Michael, you need to observe an eclipse through a colander. I tried it, but it strained my eyes. Yeah, I think I think Zoom might be the way to go. Because <laughs> I always laugh at that. You know. <laughs> okay, you can also measure. <laughs> okay, you know, I just got a good look at this slide. Yeah, I picked it out, but wow, does this date me? A Radio Shack thermometer and a pocket watch. <laughs> I am old. <laughs> wow. Anyway, um, you can measure the temperature drop during the eclipse. And the first time I ever did this was uh, for the May 30th, 1984. It was an annular eclipse, but it was really close to total. More than 99% of the sun was covered. But, uh, we were, uh, myself and, and two friends, actually observed it from a graveyard in Picayune, Mississippi. <laughs> Most tranquil. <laughs> but um, the temperature for that eclipse dropped 22 degrees. So, you know, this one, you know, it's, it's not 99% coverage. It's only about a little less than 91, but there will be some temperature drop. And if you like, you can measure it. Okay, let me give you a few tips. Again, the first one that I gave you was stay mobile. Okay, stay mobile, pay attention to the weather. I know nobody is going to, I'm, I'm not worried about your eyes after, you know, the warnings that I just gave you. But there's another form of solar safety, and it involves our skin. You know, this is the Southwest. I know it's the middle of October, but you know what the sun is like here in the middle of October. And you're going to be out under that sun for several hours. So please, use sunscreen. Well, other things are, if you're traveling, and if you don't exactly know where you're going to be set up, even if you do, it's a, it's, it's a good idea to have water with you. Um, we, we wouldn't leave the house without a case of water in the trunk. A broad-brimmed hat is a great idea. Uh, in lieu of that, you can use an umbrella, okay? Same root word, okay? It blocks out the sun. And Ollie and I like reclining chairs to view the event because I don't do well standing for three hours and I'm not a fan of sitting on the ground. So we always bring uh, recliners with us during this time. Never, never, never do this, okay? These are unfiltered binoculars, but she has solar glasses on. Okay, first of all, this was taken years ago. We were in Milwaukee, and you can see in the background there, it's totally overcast because it was mainly totally overcast all the time in Milwaukee. So glad to be here. Um, and she's not even looking in the direction of the sun, okay? But if she were, the concentrated light and heat through those binoculars would burn through those glasses so fast, you, I mean, you couldn't even blink. Okay, very, very dangerous to do that. The filters always go on the front end of the optics. One further tip, you're staying mobile, okay? So um, if, you're, if you're pulling into a hotel or your RV or whatever um, for the night, gas up the night before. Because, you know, you might hear a weather report that says, uh, you know, it's going to be cloudy here, but an hour, or an hour and a half up the road. And you don't want to, you don't want to take the time to stop for gas. You know, you may have to bolt in the middle of the night. Gas stations on smaller roads might be, might be closed. So gas up and, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, just, just have that, uh, have that going for you. Okay. One other thing I want to say is, see this event, okay? 
see it. We're amateur astronomers. Amateur astronomers like to create bucket lists. Oh, I remember when I had a bucket list and I wanted to see the Horsehead Nebula. And I wanted to see, you know, a, a multiple uh, shadow transit on Jupiter. Um, if an annular eclipse is on your bucket list, well, this is the one for you because the next one in the United States isn't until 2039. And look at the path. It only goes through Alaska. If you're gonna if you're gonna stay in the 48 states, which you might, you know, for legal reasons, but if you're gonna do that, it's not until 2046 that we're gonna get another annular eclipse in the US. The 48 states will see two total solar eclipses before we get an annular eclipse. Okay. So please, uh, if if you want to see an annular eclipse, this is your chance. Go see it, and I'm sure it will be uh, a fun time. Make a mini vacation out of it. Great. Okay. Permit me a small commercial. Okay. The top two books I did with uh, my co-author Michael Zeiler, who did the, he did the maps, I did the text. So those are available on uh, his website, greatamericaneclipse.com. And then I did one just for the 2024 solar eclipse uh, for Astronomy Magazine, and it's on their web website at myscienceshop.com. Um, if you don't have the resources to buy these books, or if you don't want to support your local author, but I know you do. Anyway, I have a copy of each of these books with me that I'm going to donate to the club library tonight, so you can check them out here. And that, as they say, is that. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah, uh, we're going to turn the lights up. So do I need to stop? So close this. I brought some show and tell. <clears throat> oh, <laughs> a lot of show and tell. <laughs> so this will be in no particular order. Now. Oh. Okay. So. So for uh, the binoculars that Holly uses for the eclipse, they're Fujinon binoculars, um, we have these filters that slip on over them, and they will stay on the entire time during this eclipse. For the total eclipse next year, you know, you pull them off during the total part. So these are solar filters that you can use. You can also buy these filters that are flat, but foldable. And so they can fit over a variety of sizes of telescopes or binoculars. I'll just leave these out here. And if you like, you can take a look at them. Um, okay. Oh. You're gonna use them. <laughs> there you go. Could have done that. <laughs> but uh, if you're going to use a welder's glass and you saw Holly holding it, well, her hands are a lot steadier than mine. I'm always afraid I'm going to drop it. And so I bought this. And I've seen, I've actually seen people at Eclipse full welder's helmets, you know, with, uh, with, this, uh, with this filter in it. But again, this is a number 14 uh, welder's filter. And uh, that's, that's a good way to keep your hands free. Now, we've got, these are the regular solar eclipse glasses, okay? And if you don't have any of these, I'm going to pass these boxes around. If you don't have any, take a couple, okay? If you do have them, 
take one and give it to somebody. But these are uh, compliments of Celestron. You know, we were chatting the other day about some other project I'm doing for them. And uh, they said, well, you know, if you ever need any filters, you know, for your talks, I said, yeah, actually I do. So please take some of those. I don't need them back. I didn't pay for them. They're great publicity for Celestron. They, they love you to have it. Uh, another type of solar filter is a solar viewer. This is a little bit, you know, less breakable than uh, the uh, welder's glass, but you can hold it in front of your eyes. You can also, instead of the cardboard glasses, you can go Terminator. <laughs> you know, I'll be back for the next eclipse. There's a danger with these, though. Okay? You know what it is? If somebody sees you wearing these, they're going to say, oh, look at Michael. He's using sunglasses to view this eclipse. These are not sunglasses. And if you pick them up and look through them, you can't see anything. The only thing that shines through these is the sun. So make sure if you're with anybody that they know that these are not sunglasses. But uh, these tend to fit my, my head actually a little bit better than the cardboard glasses, which tend to uh, shake off. And then again, Celestron has come out with a couple problems. It's kind of fun. You know, most of the time, most of the time you have uh, glasses like that. Well, Celestron has come out with a uh, two power solar viewer. The only thing you can see through it is the sun. And so uh, that's kind of cool. And finally, um, we have solar binoculars. Open these before. <laughs> okay. And again, the only thing that you can see through these binoculars is the sun. Okay. You're not going to be looking at the moon or anything else because, uh, thank you, Jim, because uh, these are specifically made for the sun. They're 10 power. Um, Front lens doesn't matter. I mean, it's the sun, so plenty of light is going to get in. But they are—they're uh, very nice. You know, I've used them. We've tried them. You know, I'm going to—I'm going to be writing a story for the magazine about Eclipse products, and that will—that uh, will certainly get in them. So these are some of the products that you can use for your annular Eclipse expedition. And uh, now, I can take questions. Thank you. Um, okay, do we have questions in the room? All right, I'm headed that way. Now, those of you who are used to this on Zoom know there'll be a little bit of delay for me to walk back with the microphone. Hi. <laughs> those are wonderful products. Um, Fred is getting fairly old, and um, he well, hasn't shown lead, signs yeah. of running down yet, but I've been worried for... A couple of years what's going to happen when he becomes less active are you seeking to replace fred absolutely no no nobody can replace fred okay first of all and and we're talking about uh eclipse guru fred espinak who worked for nasa for many years uh, i remember years ago uh getting his publications that he sent out for every eclipse no no uh, i'm i'm definitely not going to replace fred um, as far as uh, maps, Michael Zeiler is probably the one that will kind of take over that. Um, you know, we did, uh, so I, I brought these books for the club. Let me show you this one. We did this one. The Atlas. Okay, this, this talks about every eclipse solar eclipse, including partials, uh, from 2020 to 2045. And uh, so, um, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't want to say that Michael will be replacing Fred, but uh, he will probably be the main resource, at least in the United States, for many years to come. I have another question in the room.
Hi, I'm uh, wondering what uh, spectroscopy you can do uh, from Bailey beads. I'm just, you know, what kind of science you can get either from the moon or the sun with them. Spectroscopy um, is usually done um, uh, with total eclipses. And I guess you could do it with annular eclipses when the edge of the moon is just about to cover as much of the sun as possible and move to the edge of the sun. They do what's called a flash spectrum, okay? And flash spectrums show the various elements in the uh, corona of the sun, okay? Because that's really the only time it's visible during total solar eclipses. Uh, some telescopes, very few, have what's called a coronagraph where they can block out the disk of the sun, but eclipses are way better. So um, some amateur astronomers have done flash spectra, and I know I've uh, published several of them. I was photo editor of the magazine also, so I, I published several of those through the years while I was there. Um, so that's, uh, that's what you can learn. You know, you can learn a little bit about the composite. It's a great teaching tool, because the spectral lines are fairly evident. You know, <clears throat> an element was discovered on the sun um, several decades before it was found here on Earth, and that was helium, okay, back in the uh, 19th century. The reason it's called helium is because the sun's Greek name is Helios, okay? So, uh, so a lot can be done with that, and it's, it's a great teaching tool, absolutely. We have another question here. Thanks. Uh, I'm sorry, curious what brand of binoculars those are. Celestron. They're Celestron. Celestron. Can they be used for just looking at sunspots? I mean, yes. not just eclipse. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Great. Thanks. They're they're ten powers, so they will show sunspots. Probably, probably moon sized sunspots. Yeah, Mike. Um, what about the speed of the shadow? Is that different uh, for a uh, annular eclipse versus a total eclipse, or what? What makes that different from one one eclipse to another, or is it always constant? So the shadow moves slowest if the sun is overhead. Okay, but we live on a round Earth, and so as the eclipse progresses. Uh, it, it generally starts out fast, slows down, and then speeds up again as it encounters more and more of Earth's curvature, okay, along the path. So that's that's why the speed uh, changes for, for the uh, for the total eclipse next year, April eighth. And you know, if uh, if it's okay, I'll be back in January to talk about that. Um, the I believe the shadow starts in Texas at around 1,500 miles an hour. And then by the time it leaves Maine, it's, uh, it's twice that speed. Uh, yes, uh, Michael. Uh, I had recently read about and phenomenon called a hybrid eclipse, uh, which starts out either as an annular or total eclipse and ends up as an annular or total eclipse. Do you, are you familiar with that, uh, with that aspect? Yes. Um, and it's, you know, that one of those early slides that I showed the three types of solar eclipses, well, that's actually the fourth type, but it's only a couple percent of all eclipses. So a hybrid eclipse sometimes called an annular total eclipse, usually starts out as an annular eclipse because, again, uh, we live on a round planet and it, um, where the shadow first encounters Earth to where the maximum eclipse occurs, there's a difference of about 4,000 miles, half of Earth's diameter, okay? So the shadow, uh, the, the um, moon is actually 4,000 miles farther away during the beginning of the eclipse, uh, or it could be at the end of the eclipse, 
than it is at maximum. So at maximum, that's where it's total. And some annular total eclipses have totalities of only a second or two. You know, others, none of them are very long. You know, others might be 20 seconds or so. But for much of the path, it's an annular eclipse. And then it switches to total when that, when the distance decreases enough so that the moon looks just a little bit bigger. So yes, that's a great question. That is the fourth type of solar eclipse. Okay, other questions in the audience? Now we know that the moon is slowly moving away from the earth. Uh, so what is a forecast of when uh, there will only be annu annular eclipses? We won't, uh, when will we cease to have total eclipses? Yeah, you're absolutely right. The moon is slowly moving away from earth. What is it about a centimeter a year or something like that? Okay, so uh, we will no longer be able to have total eclipses, sorry to say, 600 million years from now. Okay. Sorry. After that, they're all annular. <laughs> you know? So that, it, you know, it's, it's a slow progression for the moon. <laughs> Okay, other questions in the Sorry, room? Has one, me? Okay. Take me a second to get there. So this is, probably shows a little bit of my ignorance, but on the maps of the solar eclipse path, there's ellipses. What are they? showing. I can't understand what those ellipses mean. So those are, the ellipses are the shape of the moon's shadow on Earth. Okay, so if, if the moon is, for example, directly overhead, it's as close to a circle as it gets. But as it spreads out, you know, as, as, as it spreads out because of Earth's curvature, it stretches a little bit. Okay, so that's that's what those show. So it's round at the maximum point of right. the eclipse. Right. Okay, got it. Okay, any other questions in the room at the moment? Okay. I am coming. Uh, what do you think about Roswell for a start? And then if you had to be mobile, um, I guess you could run over to Texas or I, I'm just, we're, we're going to try to go. So I'm, I, I really want to pick your brain on that. Not that you can predict the weather, but. <laughs> uh, it, you know, um, Jim just said, well, you can get on the spaceship. <laughs> I like that. Uh, Roswell would be a great place to start. Again, because of Balloon Fest, Albuquerque seems to have some pretty high prices, but Roswell is well within the path. It would be a great spot. It's, uh, according to climate data, it's one, of the, it's one of the best spots that we think, you know, has the possibility of clear weather. Okay. Uh, I think it'd be a great spot. I've never been there. It's in the mountains. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Oh, it isn't? Oh, okay. I'm thinking of Rio Doso. I'm sorry. Yeah, Rio Doso definitely. Okay, Paul, is that a question? Okay, I'm coming. Could you wait for the microphone, Paul? Okay, here you go. Would you start your question over? Okay. Uh, do you know of any places along the path of annularity near the center line where you can camp. Oh, I'm, I'm, I don't know of any specific place because for several years now, you know, we're going to meet up with my co-author at his home in Santa Fe and head out from there. But there are many, many campgrounds. There are a number of interstates cross 
you know, the path, especially in Texas. Um, and as you get closer, especially to San Antonio, a huge metropolis, you know, almost 4 million people or more than 4 million. So, uh, uh, yeah, there'll be plenty of spots to camp. Um, I, think, um, I think Google Maps, you know, will, will show camping locations if you toggle that, uh, that specific uh, uh, search. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, you said uh, San Antonio. Um, I just wonder if, uh, if it, uh, will it pass like, uh, where with respect to San Antonio, uh, will that? Uh, the path? Yeah. Goes right over San Antonio. Goes right over. Right over okay. the whole city. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering if it'll, uh, pass over Garner State Park, which is about 90 miles this side of San Antonio. That's where I'm planning to go for the uh, for the 2024 total. It's right near the center of line of totality for that eclipse. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if this one, of course, it's a little far I from I don't here. know the location of Garner State Park, but yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, soon you'll be able to check it out on on one of the maps in one of these books. <laughs> okay, yeah, I can I can figure it out instantly right. if I yeah. saw it on a map. Okay, other questions in the room? <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Every question is well worthwhile to make sure that we hear it and you get your answer. And May gets her steps. Thank you. I'll make it uh, short, sweet, and to the point. Hydrogen Alpha Telescope, good investment or bad investment? Okay. <clears throat> I have a Hydrogen Alpha Telescope. I love it. I love looking at, especially when the sun is active, like it is now, because through a, a visual filter, you see sunspots. It's pretty much it. You can see a couple other things. But through a hydrogen alpha telescope, you can see flares, you can see prominences, you can see a lot of detail that you don't ordinarily see or you, that you don't see through a visual filter. Now, okay, there's that. It's a great instrument to use, great instrument to view the sun, but they're expensive, okay? Yeah, they're, they are expensive. You know, the one that I have um, is now something like, Almost five thousand dollars. Oh, only five k. Yeah, that's well, a small one. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, oh, I I love hydrogen alpha observing. What does it look like during an annual eclipse? That do they provide any greater detail no. during it? No, no. Okay. Yeah, I mean, cool. it's just it's basically uh, the regular hydrogen alpha view with the center blacked out. <laughs> you know, I mean, okay. so it's kind of cool. You know, just like just like it would be through a visual filter, but you no, know, it doesn't add anything during the eclipse. Yeah, very <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Okay, that's that's absolutely. People can ask two questions for sure. Um, you mentioned the uh, 1970 total solar eclipse as being pivotal for you. You're actually the third person in the last week who's made a statement basically that way. I wonder about the people in the room here. How many people have had that 1970 solar eclipse as being you no know, pivotal or memorable or actually it's a lot fewer than I thought. Wow. Wow. I was near Virginia Beach. Where were you guys? I, w I was a partial in Denver. But... Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. But... No, I, I actually travel. I... So I was living near Pittsburgh at the time. I was very young. Well, yeah, I was very young, just just born. Um, but uh, traveled to uh, Virginia Beach to view that, and so glad that I did. Okay, who else with a question? Okay, we're going to move to the. Wait a minute, we have one more in the room. We will get to your Zoom people in a bit, and we'll give you as much time as you need to. It's not so much a question as a comment. I go to Google Maps, you know, to to, to figure out where I want to be for the path of 
path of uh, annularity or total. It sure be nice if Google Maps would have it set up in there so that you would type in, you know, path of totality for blah, 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 and then it would show up on there. Okay, so so if, if you know anybody at Google Maps or anything, it'd be nice if you could. Don't, don't have to. It's already been done. Uh, if you look up the website of a French colleague, friend of ours, called his name is Xavier Jubier. I'll spell that. <laughs> Uh, yeah. uh, it, it's his first name is Xavier X A V I E R, and the last name is J U B I E R. Uh, Xavier has taken Google Maps and and made and I mean they are zoomable to a degree that you cannot believe. You can type in uh, uh, place locations, not just cities, not just countries, but I mean parks you know um any place that uh google maps has on it so um i don't i don't exactly it's a it's a french website it's not it's in english but uh, if you look up the the name xavier x a v i e r j u b i e r j u b i e r yeah okay. and uh you know his his website is Gary, it has so much information on it. It's he's he's just great. Yeah. Okay, I got something on base minor league baseball. <laughs> so Z A or X A V I E R. Right. J A V I E R. J U B O I E R. The space in between. Oh, good. Yeah. Mm. It's it's also Jim also put it in the chat. Oh, great! Thank you. Okay. So for people in the room, Zoom can uh, Jim can write it down for you after the meeting as well. Okay. Any other questions in the in the room? Oh, it, it looks like that our Zoom people are actually going to get a turn here. So we didn't totally leave them out. And they've been very patient, which we appreciate. All right. Uh, first one up is just a comment from David Levy. He just uh, wanted to say that he respectfully disagrees with Michael that partials are wonderful. David Levy, that <laughs> hack? <laughs> you can take that with light, what you want. <laughs> Well, you know, we, I live by four words. It's all about totality. Okay. The annular eclipse is, is cool, but oh, wait till April, wait till April, man, it's going to be spectacular, but okay. I can buy that. You know, I mean, uh, I've seen a number of eclipses actually from David's house when I used to work here at the planetarium back in the eighties. So. All right. Moving right along. Um, Alan asks, let's see, wouldn't you see Bailey's beads no matter where in the path you are located? Isn't the moon going to cross in front of the sun everywhere in the path? Yes. Yes, that's true. You will see Bailey's beads, you know, through, through a telescope. They're a little tough in binoculars during an annular eclipse, but a telescope will definitely show them. The reason we're at the northern edge is that literally it, it looks like the edge of the moon is rolling around the edge of the sun and you get this extended run so it's not just a few seconds of bailey's bees it'll be in excess of a minute that'll look cool uh let's see franklin asks will the club have any travel plans to members to see totality in 2024 not that i know of i don't think we're doing that as a club so I mean, it's your best bet's probably to just join together with some other people that want to go. Um, and you're almost already getting too late to make reservations. So you need to be doing that quickly. Right. The annually, you're still fine if you're not trying to go to Albuquerque. Right. Uh, let's see. Susan Rubin asks, is it better to invest in the solar glasses or the solar binoculars? Glasses. Okay, because they're only two bucks. Um, the binoculars are, I don't even know how much they are, uh, but uh, 
Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> this is a very specialized instrument. I mean, amateur astronomers, you know, if you're a dedicated amateur, you probably should have one. They might be about 40 bucks. Um, I'm, I'm glad that I have one. Of course, I didn't pay for it, so full disclosure. <laughs> All right, uh, let's see. Susan also uh, um, mentions, I remember that I was in New Jersey at the time of the 1970 eclipse. Um, Heidi said, uh, timeanddate.com has great eclipse info. In fact, they will be doing a uh, live stream of the eclipse from uh, within the annularity. Uh, and I think uh, myself and, and probably Bernie Stinger uh, may be participating with them from Roswell. So if you can't get to it, that's a good option to be able to see the, uh, the annular. Uh, Franklin also says, let's see, website time and date has an eclipse section with maps showing the path. If you click at any point, it will show you details of duration and location. So there's another map option for you. Otherwise, there's just a lot of thank yous and a great presentation. Terry, anything? I... No. Okay, and it doesn't look like we have any questions from uh, YouTube. Oh, there is. There are no questions from um, YouTube. The I looked up the binoculars. The ones that. Uh, Michael has are closer to 80 to 90 dollars depending on where you go and they do have a version that's 45 ish dollars but they're the um like a what do you call that roof roof prism small 10 by 25 celestron thank you so much Michael we appreciate all of this and We're, we're delighted to see all of your goodies and everything as well. And um, and Michael is donating a book, I think, to the club, three books. So uh, so those will go in our library. And, um, and we really, really appreciate that because, of course, they'll stay there for years. And so, you know, many people can use them over time. Um, so... Um, I, we are tonight, uh, for those who are here in person, we have um, liquid refreshments um, that will be in the lobby after the meeting. And, um, and I think unless we have some other announcement to make, we are probably finished for this evening. Okay, we're going, oh, wait a minute. We were about to say goodbye to social media. Did you want to say something before that? We'll be available for checkout in the library starting at the July general meeting. I have to take them home and make right. sure they're stamped. Yes. The books will not be available for checkout tonight after the meeting. Okay. The July. July meeting. Thank you. Um, yes. Oh, Eric, you're here. Yes. I didn't see you. Okay, Eric has our planet report. Okay. 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 Okay, so we have an announcement about the solar eclipse workshop. Are you doing that? No. Okay. Um, okay. Well, we are going to close out with social media tonight. We're sorry for a little bit of confusion here. We're trying to talk about lots of great things at the same time. Um, so anyway, we appreciate uh, everyone who came on social media tonight. Um, you know, the tonight's presentation will be posted and Michael, there were at least a couple of times in your presentation that, you know, I said to myself, you know, I'm going to look up the recording for this because I really want to hear this again. I want to make sure, you know, that, that I retain that. And you were saying so much information at one time. 
I was sure I wasn't going to remember all the things I wanted to remember. So, um, so I, the presentation will be, remain on social media, and and p please feel free to access it there. For our social media guest, I want to remind you that we are here every first Friday of the month um, at six thirty and our uh, six thirty Tucson time, and uh, and we would love for you to come back and visit us anytime. We do post these presentations, you know, always on our YouTube uh, channel. And so you can look them up later. And we appreciate your coming. And, and we hope that you will look over our website because we've got lots of astronomy information there and, you know, good hints about um, equipment or good hints about you know, activities that you can do for children in astronomy. So, you know, please just move around the website and you will see lots of different kinds of things there. And we hope that you will join us next Friday. So thank you so much.